Oh, uh, welcome back. Uh, so remember, uh, I don't know, any questions that uh, came up in your heads last night while you couldn't sleep? Uh, at least I couldn't. Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, so, so we had, uh, so remember that we, I wanted to prove that uh, if you have a, uh, a non-amenable Markov chain in the sense of Fellner, then it's also non-amenable in the sense of Kasten, so the uh, spectral radius, uh, right? So, uh, so recall. Ah, and I shouldn't write there. Anyway, recall. For that, okay, this is not important for the record. <laughs> we have proved. Uh, so what we are proving is that so if so if the Markov chain uh, uh, has uh, the uh, so is non-amenable. So if H, which was defined by the infimum. Uh, of uh, right, this uh, the total conductance going out of finite uh, of the finite set S. Uh, okay, wait. Uh, how should yeah? I mean, it's, that's fine. Uh, divided by the stationary measure uh, of S. So S is in V finite. And that's positive. So again, this is right, the, the uh, remember the, oh, where should, where should I write, where, uh, So this thing right, is just the sum of the conductances. Sorry, so let's call it. Ah. Okay. And, and these, uh, these were actually the conductances. Right, the probability of getting out is the conductance of the edge divided by the sum of the conductances, which is a stationary measure. Right, so this thing is the conductance, uh, and the, and this is the total conductance uh, of the transitions out of S. Huh? And uh, and we assume a, a Fellner non-amenability, uh, and we want to show. Uh, Okay, so what we have what we have proved is that uh, given this, uh, so so let's define. So what I wrote uh, last time, I said okay, I write it in red I, because I uh, I don't like it anymore. Uh, I wrote this. Uh, so let's, instead of this, I will use uh, S of F uh, today. So the gradient of F is, uh, um, right, the, the distance. So, so this is a function defined on the edges. So this is the derivative. Uh, so F X, Fy minus Fx on the edge Xy divided by the length of the edge which is the resistance. So it's multiplied by uh, the conductance. Okay, it will be an L1 type norm. Uh, so I just take absolute value. Uh, we had the one half because I don't want to worry about the, the ordering of X and Y. And I'm dividing by the resistance, meaning multiplying by the conductance. Uh, and I take the sum of the absolute values. Why I don't like uh, to call it the L1 norm anymore, because I should tell you what is the measure on uh, the edges, right? I'm taking L1 norm with respect to what? 
So here I'm taking, it seems, L1 norm with respect to counting measure. Okay. Uh, however, in a second, I'm going to take the L2 norm not in the counting measure. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to write this. Uh, but anyway, what we proved was that uh, for this one with this uh, little integral trick, if you remember, uh, that uh, this thing is at least h times uh, the L1 norm of s. Uh, this h times the L1 norm of s, uh, where this is really in, in pi, right? The, uh, Uh, okay, so we prove this. Uh, why does it imply uh, non-amenability uh, in in, uh, in in Kastan's version? So uh, so I was saying that uh, this is like a, a natural discrete version of uh, the gradient. So there is also a natural discrete version of the Laplace operator. Uh, so for any Markov chain, this is one usual definition. Uh, sometimes it's the opposite, p minus i, sometimes this. Uh, so, sorry? So p is the Markov operator and i is the identity. Uh, right? So why is it natural to call it uh, uh, the Laplace operator? Well, because uh, what does it mean that uh, the Laplace of f is zero. It means uh, right, that uh, p of f is f, which means that uh, at every point you are the average of the neighbors, uh, which means that you are that f is satisfying the uh, what is it mean value property, just like in continuum uh, the uh, harmonic functions. <laughs> So it's a natural thing. And then uh, if you take uh, this thing, uh, so you take the, the Laplace of F and, uh, and F in the, uh, and you take the inner product in, uh, 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 with respect to pi, then, uh, so in continuum, Laplace is uh, this grad, so you move div in the uh, you know, by integration by parts to the other side, and you get uh, grad f, uh, the inner product of uh, of grad f with itself. In what norm? So what uh, in what inner product? Uh, and here I'm really uh, so so let me define this inner product. So it's the sum, okay, one half. So right, this is again on the edges. So all uh, all pairs of vertices, uh, one half, and I have uh, this thing uh, squared because it's the same. Uh, and I'm uh, so kind of. If the edge is long, I want to take uh, it's there is more space, so I want to take the inner product uh, uh, like this. Uh, so what is it? Okay, so here I had a, uh, right in a, I had multiplication by c twice. I mean. Here I have it once in the in the gradient. Here I have it twice, and I'm dividing once, so it is uh, one half the sum of x and y, f x minus f y uh, squared times c x y. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, so why is this true? 
So, okay, so you can think of this just as the definition. Uh, this is often called uh, this thing, the Dirichlet energy of F, of a function on the vertices, right? Uh, Dirichlet energy. Uh, and why is it true? Well, if you if you do the summation, you see it. It's kind of it's kind of clear that uh, right, you expand this, you have uh, the f x squared uh, c x y, so you can just sum over y uh, and get uh, pi of x. Uh, similarly, you have it here, so you have twice uh, uh, the L two norm of f. Uh, you have the one half, so you have once the L2 norm of F. Uh, here you have I minus P, so you have F, F. Okay, that's the, uh, the L2 norm of F. And uh, that is the minus uh, two times Fx, Fy, Cxy. You have the one half, so it's minus, minus Fx, Fy, uh, Cxy. Uh, Okay, you take out the fx, sum over y, you get p of fx. So you get the inner product between uh, f and pf, as I said. So uh, that's it. Uh, okay, uh, and therefore, uh, so if I want to prove that uh, uh, the spectral radius of, uh, of p is less than one, uh, that means that, uh, that I, I want to prove that this thing uh, is at least a constant times the L2 norm of F. Hmm? So let's try uh, and do uh, something like that. Right? So, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, sorry. Okay. So from here, I want to get uh, to the to this uh, direct energy. Uh, so notice the following. Uh, so for the right, I will I will want to divide by f. Uh, I mean f uh, the norm of f the L two norm of f squared. Uh, in this ratio, right? When I'm uh, uh, when I'm calculating uh, uh, the norm, uh, so this I can write as the L one norm of F squared, and now I'm applying uh, this thing to uh, F squared. Uh, so this is. Uh, one over h times this s of f squared. Uh, okay, so this is one over h, one over two. Okay, I'm just writing the definition of uh, of s of f squared. Uh, okay, maybe I maybe I'm not writing. Sorry. Uh, Okay, so I could write, if you want to finish, put the, uh, the absolute value at right cxy. Uh, but so instead of that, you know, this is a difference between squares. So let's write it as, a, as fy minus fx times fy plus fx. Uh, okay, and... Uh, Okay, and let's put here the absolute value. Uh, and here, of course, and let's also put here absolute values. So this is definitely like this. Uh, and we have the CXYs. And now, Uh, 
Okay, is that good? I don't know if. Uh... Okay, we'll see. Uh, okay, and now let's use Cauchy Schwartz uh, on uh, on this thing. Uh, so I have the one over h. I have square root of uh, one half sum x y f x minus f y squared c x y. Uh, so this is what this part, and we have the other uh, square root sum x y f x squared plus f y squared p x y and i used so <clears throat> i put one from this one half i put i have put a square root of one half uh, here square root of one half here and the one half has disappeared from here and also i changed this thing why because uh, i have to take the square of this and of course so i used that uh, a plus b over 2 is smaller than a squared plus b squared over 2 and maybe where i mean yeah uh, so i use that here mm. Okay, and uh, so what did I get? That this, uh, okay, so maybe let's square. So F, the L2 norm, fourth power is smaller than one over H squared. Uh, okay, that's the, that's the direct energy of F. And that thing is, okay, it, it just uh, falls apart. I mean, I can just, uh, you know, open the bracket and do the summation and it's, twi uh, it's twice. Uh, so I get uh, twice B. L2 norm squared of S. Okay. Uh, okay, so that means that A squared over two is a lower bound on uh, the Dirichlet energy divided by the L2 norm of square. Sorry, I mean the square of the L2 norm, uh, right? And just uh, divide it through. And that's what we wanted, right? Because this is a, uh, uh, right? I mean, it's the F. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, right, and I said that uh, this is actually also the the infimum over f. Uh, this is the uh, the norm of p. Uh, so with minus, it's uh, okay. So the norm of p is at most one minus that. So it's non-amenable in the sense of Keston. Uh, okay, right. So, so remember, we got this by saying that uh, sort of that you know the idea is to to look at the level set of uh, of the function, uh, and if for each level set we have uh, the right isoperimetry, then also for the function uh, we have this L one. Uh, uh, bound, 
and then with some cautious words we get the L2 bound. So that's the. Uh, okay, so. Um, so that's about the uh, amenability. Now, uh, how does this look like for finite graphs? Why do I care about finite Markov chains and finite graphs? Well, because in uh, the universe, everything is finite, uh, apparently, right? Uh, according to physics. Uh, so there are no infinite graphs, in, in fact, even though we like them. Uh, uh, so let uh, so what is the right what are the right analogs of of amenable nominable uh, in a, for finite graphs? So uh, so let's say first Jigger constant. Uh, of a finite Markov chain. Okay, let's say reversible. So it's not that. Okay, it doesn't have to be actually reversible. So let's okay, finite Markov chain with the total measure, total stationary measure one. Well, so it's a, it's the infimum of uh, the sum x is in s, y is in uh, s complement, pi of x. Uh, dxy divided by pi of s. Okay, I cannot just take all sets, all subsets uh, of the vertices, because if I take all finite subsets of the vertices of the state in the Markov chain, because if I take s to be v, then this is just zero trivially. So very simply. Just let's take the smaller part, the smaller half. Okay, uh, there are versions uh, instead of this. Sometimes uh, people take uh, like so. Forget about this and take the minimum between a uh, pi of s and pi of s complement. Okay, that's the same, but uh, not exactly the same. Is that you take a uh, For certain goals, this is better to take. Uh, anyway, so there are different versions, but they are more or less the same. Okay, so that's that's the direct analog of this. You know, the way uh, you should think of this is that uh, a small h means that the Markov chain has a bad bottleneck, right? Uh, you can uh, separate with a small cost, with a small uh, uh, conductance uh, flowing through the two pieces, S and S complement, uh, such that the, the parts. So you can cut the Markov chain into two relatively large pieces with relatively small, with relatively small cut. Uh, and uh, okay, and then uh, a definition is that uh, so if this is big, then the graph. If is if this if this is big, but the Markov chain is sparse or a graph is sparse then we call it an expander. So uh, that's one definition. So, and, uh, so expanders are usually, uh, so the notion is not for general Markov chains, but for graphs, uh, typically. For Markov chains, you just talk about uh, the, con anyway, that's the trigger constant of the Markov chain. <laughs> but anyway, so an NDC expander, an NDC isoperimetric, Ah, 
this is still not visible. I don't know. Okay, let's expander is a graph with uh, n vertices. degrees, so either bounded from above by D or equaling D, that's, uh, that's two versions. Uh, okay, let's say equaling D. So D regular graph and uh, H, H is at least C. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, a sequence of expanders is where uh, C and D are fixed, and N in the sequence, you can have arbitrary large graphs. And so bounded degree, uh, uniformly positive Jigger constant, arbitrary large N. Hmm? That's, uh, that's the definition of an isoperimetric expander. Uh, examples. Um, okay, so it looks like the analog of non-amenable, maybe. So maybe non-examples are easier. Uh, so not an expander. Okay, tell me some examples of non-expander graphs. Right, so if you take the n by n, uh, box in the square lattice, you cut it in the middle, uh, you have uh, two equal sizes, uh, but the cut requires only, a, in, you know, n squared, n squared uh, volumes, but n to the, but order n uh, edges to cut. So in the stationary measure, you know, it's one half, one half, but this is one over n in this. Uh, so this has, a, I mean, in general, if you take a, the n by n box in a dimension d, then the Chigger constant is approximately uh, ah. Okay, I did. Okay, homework. What it is? It's it's one over n here, <laughs> but the d. Okay, uh, the formula you have to think about. Uh, Okay, let's write it here. So D minus, there's a D minus one, but okay, anyway, also the, okay, anyway, never mind. Calculate it. Uh, okay, so this is not, this is not a uniformly positive thing. Okay, this is not exactly a regular graph. If you want to make it regular, you take the totals. Uh, Okay, uh, what else is not good? So what was, uh, you know, the simplest non-amenable graph is the regular tree. So if you try something like a regular tree, well, but it's a finite graph, so let's say it's a finite tree, so it has leaves. Uh, well, this is a super bad uh, for an expander because, uh, and with uh, cutting one edge, you can uh, cut it into two big pieces. So awful. Uh, so really, H is like uh, uh, well one over the size of the tree. Okay, let let me not write n because it's sort of a different scale. But okay, so let's say one over the size of the vertex set. Okay, up to constant factors. So this is not very good. Uh, so what is a good example? Uh, so somehow you want to, so it's unclear at first sight uh, how, to make, how to make examples. Uh, so the first examples were uh, random graphs are, are good expanders. So, uh, so usually it's uh, G and D is the uniform 
random, so uniformly random deregular graph on n vertices. So let's assume that n times d is even, so that you actually have deregular random graph, uh, deregular graphs on n vertices. List all of them, pick uniformly at random one of them. That's G and D. Uh, a statement, uh, which was uh, a pin scarce, uh, okay, I don't remember, but 70s, and uh, <laughs> several other people starting with P. <laughs> uh, Pippinger and the one more, anyway. Uh, so several people noticed in the computer science uh, community that random graphs are, are, good, uh, uh, are good expanders with high probability. So right, this is just a random graph. So of course, uh, whatever your favorite, like with some certain probability, you get the torus. But you know, to get something like this is unlikely. So with high probability, it's actually, uh, with probability tending to one, it will be uh, uh, an expander. Now, how do you prove something like that? I'm not going to prove it. Uh, that would be like a, a like a combinatorics uh, class. Uh, you know, one uh, one issue with uh, computing anything about this is that uh, how do you generate such a such an animal? Uh, if you want to make calculations about it, you should know how to actually produce this measure uh, in a way that you can uh, in a way that you can calculate. Uh, so, uh, so there is something called the uh, configuration model of, uh, uh, of Bolobash. I don't know, 881 or something, 78, uh, which is like a, so <clears throat> let's say you want to produce a three regular uh, uh, random graph. So you have your N vertices. For each of them, start uh, D half edges, and then, uh, on this n times d, okay, I didn't succeed, right. I need at least one more to be uh, even. Uh, and with these uh, half edges, uh, on these uh, <coughs> n times d uh, half edges, pick a uniformly random uh, matching. Now, it can ha happen that uh, there are two two matchings, uh, so two match matching edges are connecting the same uh, d tuples. So uh, it can also happen that uh, uh, you get you have this. Okay, and so once you made the matching, uh, it's clear what the graph is, right? You just, uh, I mean, what I drew, that's the graph. Uh, so this model will have, or can have loops and uh, mult multiple edges, uh, but the number, of, uh, uh, the number of loops and multiple edges remains tight as n goes to infinity. With positive probability, you don't have any of them. So with positive probability, and conditioned on not having any of them, the measure is, uh, I think, okay, I forget if it's uh, just absolutely continuous with respect to the uniform measure or it's actually uniform. Okay, think about it. But anyway, uh, this measure is similar to the uniform measure. So if you prove that something has a tiny, prob you know, probability tending to zero in this model, you also get that it has probability zero in this model. I mean, probability tending to zero in this model. Uh, 
so you and then in this one you can actually uh, do calculations. Hmm? So if uh, probability configuration model for some sequence of events tends to zero, then uh, also in uh, G and D and tends to zero, and then you. Uh, here, yeah, so that's why I'm worried about this model that I didn't want to allow for multiple edges and uh, and loops. So this construction can produce things that are not good there. But with positive probability, you get something without multiple edges and uh, with a uniformly positive probability you get. So fix D and going to infinity. So, right, so fix D, so that's the, that's the game. Uh, okay, and why is it, so why is this a good expander? How do you, cal uh, okay, so I'm not going to do the calculation, it's not that hard. But if you think of, uh, you know, the, the H would be small if you have uh, a subset of the vertices whose neighbors, uh, the set of neighbors is small. So sort of the, the edge is going out from, uh, from some place, they should sort of stick together, <laughs> like they should go into the same relatively small subset and in a random thing that doesn't happen. So if you want, you can think of this as some uh, discrete random analog of uh, negative curvature. Like, you know, when you start uh, the geodesic flow, it's, uh, it, it, it's tends to be chaotic in negative curvature. And uh, just by a silly calculation, you can produce that uh, uh, phenomenon in, a, uh, in random graphs. <clears throat> uh, okay, but uh, no, I'm not. I'm saying okay. Maybe it's the same because the trigger constant is a bounded <laughs> variable. But uh, I'm saying that with uh, so actually with uh, with probability tending to one, it's actually uniformly positive. So, so can prove, so this is what uh, Pinsker uh, did, can prove that uh, the probability that uh, HR, so that there is some C positive, so just the probability that H of G and D, uh, then, sorry, is at least uh, C, it goes to one. Okay, maybe he proved only not going to one, but, uh, Okay, May, and also maybe he looked at a different model, like bipartite the regular graph, that's uh, equally good. Uh, It depends a little bit on what you mean by optimal. Uh, the, so, so they will be Ramanujan graphs with a positive probability. So that's the conjecture. So there's a conjecture that uh, uh, about the, okay, uh, I'm just going to define the spectral gap, uh, but like the, uh, 
that the distribution of the spectral gap of these guys has to do something with trace evidom distribution. And you can actually, there's a conjecture of what the limit distribution is and the probability that it uh, exceeds the exact value for being Ramanujan is, I don't know, 52% or something. Uh, so there's the conjecture. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so, okay, but so, you know, this situation that random graphs are good expanders is not quite satisfactory because uh, if you actually want to use them for something, so, okay, why do we care, by the way? Uh, so one reason is that, uh, uh, and that was sort of the original uh, computer science motivation, uh, is that uh, these are kind of sparse but robust uh, graphs, networks. So if you want to produce, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a computer uh, network where, you know, if you cut a few edges, it is still very much connected, but you don't want to use a lot of uh, connections, then an expander you can use. Uh, so that's one, that was one motivation. Uh, Uh, if you do anything on, on graphs, so for instance, you want to study uh, the spread of uh, COVID in a human population, if, it, uh, if the human population looks like an expander graph, you know, people who are in contact, contact with each other, in contact with each other, uh, if you want to uh, uh, contain the, uh, uh, the virus, then being an expander is very bad news, right? You cannot cut off the people who are already infected. Uh, and that and we have seen that, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, another motivation for uh, trying to understand the Chigger constant of general Markov chains is that, uh, so if the Chigger constant is, uh, uh, is large, there are no small bottlenecks in the Markov chain, then when you are running the Markov chain, uh, it mixes fast. So you get to the stationary distribution of the Markov chain quickly. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, that's a separate course, uh, but, uh, but I want to give uh, one thing about, one little thing about this, which is uh, the other definition of, a, of an expander. So that would be the spectral definition, just like uh, Kasten's random walk or spectral radius uh, definition of, uh, uh, of non-amenable. Uh, we can also do that in, uh, for finite Markov chains. So, uh, so let's say reversible. Finite uh, Markov chain. Okay, uh, so this is a, a finite self-adjoint matrix the, uh, with respect to the stationary distribution, right? Uh, so its spectrum, its eigen, it has real eigenvalues, it's diagonalizable, and it has n real eigenvalues. And uh, we have seen that the uh, norm is uh, at most one. Okay, uh, obviously the one is an eigenvalue because the constant function is an eigenvector as opposed to the infinite case uh, where the constant function is not in L2. On a finite Markov chain, it is in L2. Uh, so these are, the, uh, these are the eigenvalues and uh, okay, so if you think of the question of, uh, uh, of mixing, so run the Markov chain uh, from some starting from any distribution, from one state, for instance, and you want to see uh, how fast the distribution converges to the stationary measure, to the measure that is the eigenfunction to, for eigenvalue one. How do you, see the, how do, you do this uh, in 
spectrally? Well, you take uh, your original uh, measures that you started with, you uh, write it in the basis of eigenvectors for this thing, uh, and then you apply your Markov operator many times on this uh, on this vector, and you can see that the you know with uh, you know you have the coefficients corresponding to the different uh, eigenfunctions, and uh, you know if you apply t times the Markov operator, then uh, uh, you will get lambda i to the power t uh, as a multiplicator in front of each uh, coordinate. Uh, so for the lambda one thing, you have nothing is changing, but for if all the rest have absolute value less than one, then they are exponentially quickly decaying to zero, and therefore your vector is uh, decaying exponentially fast to the stationary distribution. Uh, okay, exponentially fast with what rate? What is the expo what is the the exponential the rate of the exponential decay? Well, that depends on uh, uh, the gap here. You know, you know how uh, how big the uh, the other eigen how close the other eigenvalues are in uh, absolute value to one. So. Uh, two things, so spectral gap of a Markov chain is defined by 1 minus lambda 2, and the absolute spectral gap often denoted by G star or G apps, uh, anyway, let's call it G star, is 1 minus uh, uh, so also the absolute value of this, so 1 minus the, uh, so, so 1 minus the maximum of lambda 2, it's maybe the absolute value okay, in Okay, anyway, lambda two, lambda n, so lambda n. Right, this could be the closest to, you know, probably you have seen when is lambda n, when is it minus one? Well, that's exactly when the chain is bipartite. Because then a plus constant here and the other and the same constant minus one times minus one on the other side, this is an eigenfunction to to minus one. Uh, if it's not bad pi tide, then lambda n is bigger than strictly bigger than minus one. Uh, okay, and for sure, being bipartite is is bad news for uh, for mixing because I mean, right? We are not going to convert to the stationary distribution. Uh, however, you could still be uh, an expander graph, right? So even if you are bipartite, uh, so you have only edges between the two parts. You know, if you if you have some subset of the vertices, or you know, it, it's also okay to have things from both sides. Uh, still, it's possible that the neighborhood is big. The number of edges that coming coming out are, is big. Uh, so you can be uh, an expander, even if you are bipartite. Uh, so the so an N D uh, I don't know uh, C spectral expander or absolute spectral expander or spectral absolute no absolute spectral expander is a graph on n vertices with degrees bounded by d where the spectral gap or the absolute spectral gap is at least c. So that was the, the isoparametric expander. 
and that's the spectral expander. Uh, and the theorem due to, okay, in different settings, uh, Dojuk, uh, maybe AC4, and uh, Alon, Milman. These are actually two papers. There's an Alon and there's an Alon Milman, uh, 85 and 86. And there is a, a Lowler Sokal, uh, 88. And there is a Jerome Sinclair. Eighty-nine. So somehow the point is that uh, you know whether you look at uh, graphs or uh, Markov chains, basically that's the you know different communities. Uh, is that uh, so? One point is that uh, uh, so and the C one uh, isoperimetric expander. Is equivalent to NDC two spectral expander. Okay, by which I mean that for every C one, there is a C two. And for every C two, there is a C one. It's not a bijection. I mean, it's not a. So, you know, if you have some C1 here, you get a C2 there. If you apply it back, you get a worse C1. And there's a reason for that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe I should have started with Figure 70, who did it for in differential geometry. Uh, Right, so as I said, uh, there are uh, bipartite graphs who are expanders. Uh, and really the proof of this is the same, almost the same uh, as the one we did at the end of last class, beginning of this class. Uh, right? You want to prove, so, you know, if it's a, uh, if you are a bad expander, then uh, the, uh, the characteristic function of a bad set, okay, what, okay, you need a little bit of, uh, you know, what is the modification that you need to take? Well, because we, are, we want to estimate uh, the spectral gap, uh, not, not, not the highest eigenvalue, but the second uh, largest eigenvalue. So for that, what do you do? Well, there is, you know, you can write lambda 2 as a ratio. Uh, it's called Rayleigh, Courant, Fisher, uh, even hmm? one more. Okay, anyway. Uh, so it, right, if the supremum of PF by F, but only in the, uh, for the functions that are orthogonal to the first eigenspace. And what are the functions, right? So, sorry. Right? So you have to be orthogonal to the constant functions. Okay, so you have to do everything in the orthogonal complement of uh, the constant functions. So for instance, if I have a, 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 bad, a set with bad boundary, I have to produce a function which is orthogonal to the constant functions and uh, shows that this is bad. Okay, how do I do that? Well, I just take, uh, right, so if, uh, if, uh, so if uh, C of is small, then I will, sorry, uh, of S is small, so it has bad isoperimetry, then I will take uh, some, uh, Constant times uh, 
uh, the indicator on F plus another constant times the indicator on the complement and set F and beta such that uh, this is orthogonal to, to the constant functions. And then you can do the exact same calculation uh, as we did, and it turns out that uh, this, uh, this lambda 2 will be close to 1. The gap will be small. Uh, and vice versa, if you have a function showing that this lambda 2 is close to 1, then you want to find the level set uh, such that uh, it will have bad isoperimetry, and it will work. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not going to, to do that. Uh, uh, and number two, so this is more like the, the, so as I said, one motivation for all this business uh, is, to, is to study mixing. So, uh, so maybe that was not there at the beginning, uh, of Dojuk and Alan Milman, but it was uh, already there in, in these papers. Uh, that, uh, but for mixing, you need uh, uh, well. Okay, so what I'm going to write is just an obvious con consequence of this thing that I said. That just take it almost obvious consequence of. Uh, you know, write any function, uh, you know, expand any function in this basis of, uh, uh, of eigenvectors, uh, but, you know, coupled with uh, being uh, uh, with the first part, you will get that uh, being a good uh, isoperimetric expander uh, gives you something about mixing. So, uh, okay, did I write down the formula? So P, T, X, Y, so right? So this is the probability that starting from X at time T, I'm at uh, state Y. Uh, so how do, I, how do I say that I'm close to stationarity? Well, I want to see that, you know, the difference between uh, the, right, for any fixed X in a irreducible a periodic Markov chain, this will converge to this. So this will be small, but I want to make it small compared to the actual to the actual stationary distribution of y. Uh, and actually, for every x and y, this will this is at most one minus uh, g star to the c divided by pi of min pi min. So this is the minimal. Uh, Okay, maybe I write it so min of pi x. Okay, if you just want specific x and y, then it's something like a square root of pi x times pi y. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, so for instance, so corollary. Maybe I write it here because it's closer. Uh, and this the expander. So it's, let's say, deregular. So the stationary, well, it doesn't really matter. But okay, anyway, so the, even if it's just bounded by the, the stationary distribution is uh, like almost constant. Right? I mean, the differences between vertices uh, in, you know, the degrees are the stationary distribution. So the, uh, which means that the minimum stationary distribution is comparable to one over the number of vertices. 
So if you want to make this small, uh, so this is order one over n. So you want to you have a factor n. You want to kill that uh, factor. Uh, so you have to take t to be constant times log n, with a constant depending on how big the absolute spectral gap is. Right. So ah, sorry, uh, absolute expander. So for an NDC absolute, uh, and then we defined only for spectral. Uh, so for an NDC absolute expander, uh, a time t equals uh, a constant that depends on uh, the, the absolute spectral gap times log n. Okay, and the degree maybe. Uh, all ptx y minus i y divided by i y's are small. So yeah, pretty well mixed. And and you know this is the time. This is the best time you can hope for because. Uh, or note. So already it's a bounded degree graph on n vertices. So the diameter is already constant times log n, right? You know, in you know how far, right? In k steps, you can reach always at most uh, you know a factor of d more neighbor, more vertices. So in k steps, it's at order d to the k neighbor. So if you want to reach everyone, then k needs to be log n. Constant times log n. So already the diameter, already the diameter of the graph uh, is at least constant times log n. So obviously to to cover let's say half of the graph, you also need at least constant times log n steps. And before you already reached most of the vertices. Of course, you are very far from the stationary distribution. Uh, so, right. So, for any d regular graph or bounded degree graph, uh, you need at least constant times log n uh, steps. Okay, so in that sense, expanders are optimal for mixing. But, uh, you know, in constant time slogan, time you already uh, pretty well mixed. And you know, this is a big business. In, uh, so, for instance, if you want to simulate something in statistical for some statistical physics model. Uh, you know the easing model on some uh, graphs. Uh, then how do you do that? There are exponentially many different configurations, right? It's like plus minus uh, colorings uh, uh, of the vertices from some distribution. Uh, how do you do, do that if, if efficiently so that you can actually look at your computer how the system looks like? Well, you want to design a Markov chain. Uh, which is a good expander, uh, you know, that has a smaller. <clears throat> okay, the degrees in that case, the degrees are not necessarily important. But anyway, uh, okay, so so there's the definition. We had some random construction, but when you actually do a random construction. Uh, it's either good or not, right? <laughs> Maybe there, you know, with small probability you get a graph from your ran random construction that doesn't work. Are you worried or not? Well, I don't know. That depends on, uh, I don't know, your personality. Maybe uh, it's uh, anyway. So explicit constructions are always welcome. Uh, now, why is that hard? Uh, so maybe that a note. Constructing 
non-amenable uh, graphs or groups is much easier than uh, constructing uh, uh, expander graphs because okay so if you want if you already have a group and you want to construct a bigger group in some sense you know no, more non amenable what do you do take a cover like a universal cover of a uh, so <clears throat> so if uh, if a graph g prime covers another graph g uh, <clears throat> Mm, is this clear what I mean by co graphs covering? You know, just like with many thoughts, just you know, locally it's an isomorphism and it's subjective. <clears throat> uh, then, what does the spectral radius do? Okay, there's an inequality in a certain direction. In which direction? Yeah, because when you, if you think of the random walk definition of uh, the spectral radius, uh, you can couple the random walk on G, you can pull it up to, to a random walk on G prime, and it's the simple random walk on G prime. Uh, and Whenever you are back in G prime, you are also back at your starting point in G, but not vice versa, right? So, uh, so the return probabilities in G prime are uh, smaller than in G. Uh, so the spectral radius is smaller. Uh, so you are a better, you are, you have a, you are, you are more non-amenable in, in the in the big in the big one, but <coughs> if G prime covers G at finite graphs, what happens to lambda two? <laughs> so any eigenfunction that you have on G, you can lift it to an eigenfunction on G prime. Uh, but maybe there are even worse, so, and you get the same eigenvalue. But maybe there are even worse uh, uh, eigenfunctions on G prime. So lambda two is at least of G prime is at least the uh, the lambda two of G. <clears throat> okay, so maybe right here. So by coupling simple random walks, and this is by lifting uh, eigenfunctions coupling coupling simple and works and this is by lifting eigenfunctions uh, <clears throat> so you get a worse expander so that's that's one reason that it's not uh, it's not easy uh, okay maybe let me say another note is that, uh, for instance, planar graphs are very bad expanders always. So, there is some graph theory work, Lipton, Tarjan. Uh, so these are actually two papers uh, by them, one in 79, one whether it's 80, is that uh, <laughs> planar graphs are actually uh, hyperfinite.
So uh, Camille mentioned hyperfinitis, right? Uh, for uh, equivalence relations. Uh, so a graph sequence, so uh, let's say a bounded degree, a bounded degree uh, sequence, so a sequence of bound, okay, graph sequence. Okay, so properly a sequence, there you go. Okay, so a sequence of bounded degree uh, finite graphs is hyperfinite if you is the exact opposite of being uh, an expander. It's like even on small scales, you are not expanding. Uh, so you can remove arbitrarily an arbitrarily small uh, fraction of the edges so that you cut the graph into uh, bounded pieces, regardless of the size of the graph. So for every epsilon, there is a K, which is finite, such that from each Gn in the uh, sequence of bounded degree finite graphs Gn, uh, from each Gn uh, can I remove epsilon times an epsilon proportion of the edges. such that all uh, connected components have size at most k. Right, so for instance, if you take a, a the n by n boxes uh, in ZD, uh, then, uh, you know, given your epsilon, uh, you know, that sort of tells, you know, the boundary to volume ratio is small uh, for the boxes. So if you cut the big box into uh, finite but big boxes, then uh, you removed only a small proportion of the edges and you have this, uh, uh, okay. Yes. Yes. So, uh, So there are two ways. Uh, so one one thing is that. Uh, so of course these are two. These are just two extremes. So for a uh, uh, sequence of finite graphs, uh, you can have graphs which are neither hyperfinite nor expanders. If you just take uh, two big expanders and connect them with one one edge. Uh, then uh, this is not at all an expander, but not at all hyperfinite either. Hmm? Uh, so in the finite world, there are things in between. Uh, for groups, there are no things in between. So uh, what, when do, okay, so I will, okay, either next time or the one after, uh, I will actually need and prove some version of uh, this Ornstein Weiss theorem that uh, Kami mentioned uh, that uh, amenable groups are hyperfinite, meaning that there is an invariant, a group invariant way of removing, uh, for every epsilon, there is a group invariant way of removing an epsilon proportion of edges uh, so that you get uh, only finite pieces. Uh, 
uh, while in a non-amenable group, there is no such. You cannot do that. There is a, if you want to cut it into finite pieces, you need at least a positive, a fixed positive proportion of edges uh, to, to be removed. And then if you have some uh, approximation of the, uh, in, in some sense, in any sense, <laughs> some approximation to the, to the infinite group, uh, you will see that. Uh, however, you can, uh, so non-amenable, so for instance, the free group, you can approximate not by hyperfinite, but not expanders at all. So with hyperfinite, you can approximate only amenable groups. Uh, the free group, you can approximate not with expanders, but not hyperfinite. Kajdan groups, you cannot approximate uh, only by only by expanders you can approximate. Uh, so I, do, I didn't say what approximate means. So that's Benjamin Ishram convergence. Uh, and okay, the way I'm seeing how I'm progressing, I'm not going to talk about that. That would have been the plan for the last lecture. Uh, uh, there's a result of Gabor Kuhn. Uh, Thing that expanders can be approximated only by expander or okay this is also fine but like essentially expanders essentially expanders but uh, i'm not going to prove that as i see now uh, okay so really tomorrow i will define kashdan groups <laughs> in three different ways one will be reminiscent of uh, you know the spectral definition and one will be reminiscent of the isoperimetric definition. And okay, maybe I will skip the third one due to time. I will see. Uh, but uh, and then we will construct expanders, and then we do sort of percolation on uh, Kajdan groups. That's the plan. Thank you. You mentioned about this uh, connections to the Cassiodem. Uh, Usually, Cassiodem appears uh, for the largest eigenvalue, right? So here you have largest eigenvalue one, and the second largest eigenvalue is the one. What exactly is this? So good point. Uh, you remove the <laughs> largest eigenvalue, the trivial one, and for the second largest, you actually have. Uh, so, so, so you have the square root B thing, right? Yes. Still, you have a pseudo limit. Is that the condition? So, but even with the, uh, I think. What, what is the center of that? Okay, I have to look that up. That's a conjecture, no, not a theory. Yeah, that's a conjecture. Yes. Sorry, so if D is N minus one. Well, because there are no graphs. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
yeah, so there is this, uh, uh, so there's an, it's called Alon Bopana bound. Uh, uh, which, uh, so when I mentioned that these are, uh, were, uh, whatever, were somewhere, that random graphs are uh, with positive probability Ramanujan, that means that with positive probability they, so, uh, so that's still, so that Alon Bopana bound is still an uh, asymptotic thing. So it says that uh, uh, as n goes to infinity, uh, for a fixed D, as n goes to infinity, uh, the best spectral gap you can get is, uh, so uh, somehow related to the spectral gap of the tree, the spectral radius of the tree. So one over two root D minus one uh, plus little o one. So, you know, when you have a finite n, fix n, fix d, then I think it's completely unclear what the answer is. Uh, when, you have, when you let n go to infinity with a fixed d, uh, then, uh, uh, then you know what the, you know, the limiting best uh, spectral gap is. Uh, So C, C1 is that's the isoparametric one, right? Yes. You want that? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, also for. So it is at most one, right? I mean, so that's the, right? Basically, uh, do I still have the definition somewhere? Right, it's uh, for every set S, you look at uh, the following probability. So take a vertex, take a starting vertex for your random walk from the stationary distribution conditioned to be in the set S. Take one step with the random walk and look at the probability that you are outside. This probability is this ratio that I told you. So the, uh, uh, the smallest such probability is the isoperimetric. Uh, okay, right? So, okay, it's kind of important. So let me write, the, write it. Right? So H of P was the infimum of uh, uh, the sum X, y, so X in S, Y in S complement, uh, pi of X times P X Y divided by pi of S. And let's say pi of S is at most one half. Okay, there was this, this, this one? Uh, yeah, let's, let's look at this definition. Yeah, it's easier to understand the meaning. Uh, the other one is better for some calculations, but uh, this is better for the, for the meaning. And that's the same, right? The infimum of, so what is this? Uh, you know, pi x over pi s. So if you condition, uh, if you take from the stationary distribution condition to be in S, then that's the distribution. And this is the probability that you are outside, right? So this is the probability that X1 is not in S, given that X0 is in S in the stationary chain. Uh, also with pi S at most one half. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry, I, I did the square root with orange because I assumed that, you know, what is white is important and the rest is some variations. Uh, yeah, so it's a probability. So it's this one is at most one. Uh, Yes. For what? You cannot do that. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, like this one, like, you know, so if you have two big expanders joined by one thing, uh, from any point, for most points, you don't see this, you just see an expander, but the whole thing is not an expander. That's true. Yeah, uh, but in the finite graphic. So it depends what you want. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, just also for the others, so you have a finite sequence of graphs, converges, can con in, so there is a sequence, there's a sequence of finite graphs. Uh, sometimes they can converge to an infinite graph. Uh, okay, the, in the general uh, setup, uh, the limit graph could be a random graph. It's actually a random rooted graph. Uh, but in the simplest one, uh, you can think of converging to a transitive graph. So uh, in the benjamin Schramm sense, so we say that a, a sequence of finite graphs converges to a transitive graph uh, in locally if for any R, uh, if you look at a random, a uniform random point in GN, the finite graph, and look at the R neighborhood, you get a distribution on R neighborhoods. You know, it's a random because you took a random uh, center, and you want this distribution to converge to the distribution, you know, to the R neighborhood in the transitive graph. Hmm? Uh, so for instance, n by n box converges locally to the z squared lattice because you know uh, only at the boundary you see some little stuff and uh, in the limit they go away. Uh, uh, now, if you want to converge, for instance, to the uh, deregular tree, you can do this by, uh, so that just means locally that the, uh, the length of the smallest cycle uh, at least most, you know, you don't see many short uh, cycles. Uh, so you can construct even transitive graphs that uh, uh, locally they look tree-like, but globally it's like a uh, cycle. So globally it's not at all an expander. So it's like a finite extension of uh, the cyclic group, but the finite extension is such that uh, locally uh, there are no short cycles. Uh, 
so this is not, an, not at all an expander uh, graph sequence, but locally it converges to the tree. So for a tree, you can do this. But on Kashdan groups, whatever they are, we learn tomorrow <laughs> what they are, uh, you cannot do that. So if there's a sequence of finite graphs converging in this sense locally to a Kashdan group, then that sequence, okay, I cannot say that it's an expander sequence. For instance, because if you take just the disjoint union of two <laughs> expand, you know, this one is converging locally. Let's just take a, a disjoint union of two. This is converging locally to the same thing. You know, from a random point, it looks the same, but this is not an expander. Uh, so the statement is that uh, it's an essential expander sequence, meaning that you can remove little o n of the vertices such that each remaining component is an expander, uh, you know, uniformly. Uh, uh, so really, there is no. Uh, so you know, you construct expanders from from Kashdan groups, and you can approximate Kashdan groups only by expanders. But that doesn't mean that. So in some sense, expanders are the good analogs of Kashdan groups, but not in every respect because. Uh, I don't know, the GND, the random irregular graph that converges to the tree, to the free group, uh, which is not Kashdan, uh, is the sequence of GND should be a finite Kashdan graph sequence. So there is no good definition of, uh, uh, of finite graphs being Kashdan. Yeah, thank you.